It is a big day for us here at CNBC TV 18 as we come together to honor one of India's most legendary deal makers, a man who is a trusted confidant to India Inc. and has been doing that for over three decades now. Ladies and gentlemen, CNBC TV 18 is honored and privileged to present the CNBC TV 18 India Business Leader Awards Lifetime Achievement Award to Mr. Nimesh Kampani. Congratulations to you. I know you hate celebrating your birthday, but I'm going to take the liberty of uh, wishing you a very happy birthday from all of us here at CNBC TV 18 as you turn 70 today on the 30th of September. Thank you very much, Mr. Kampani, for joining us and wish you a very, very happy birthday. But before we go any further, here's a quick look back at the legacy of Nimesh Kampani. Nimesh will always be remembered as a person to go to and always willing to help you. He was an excellent cricketer. He wanted to play cricket for India and he turned out to be an investment banker. Nimesh Bhai, as I've always called him, has been an inspiration for a whole generation. He's been a doyen amongst investment bankers. Dad is an outstanding example and you know it's been amazing for me to have watched him over the last 40 years and been building JM Financial into a fantastic firm. The relationship with Nimesh has always been one of mutual respect. Wishes for Nimesh are a lot of happiness and a lot of pride and joy in what you've created. I'm so glad to know that Nimesh Bhai has been given Lifetime Achievement Award. He deserves it truly. You're one of the most finest human beings. Uh, congratulations uh, Nimesh Bhai on achieving this uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. This award is a salute to one and only one Nimesh company. The most important thing is the girl's child education and the medical facilities to the underprivileged people. I wish that you have more and more years to go and do the good service to investor and corporate. Let me start by asking you, Mr. Kothari. Mr. Parikh told me when I spoke to him and I asked him that we were doing this for Mr. Kampani and he said, I never thought he would be an investment banker. At best, I thought he'd be a cricketer. What was, what was, your, uh, what was your thinking? Well, frankly, I also didn't think that he will be an investment banker. Uh, I know Nimesh since 1963. You can calculate the years now. Nimesh, for me, which very close friend in college also. We played cricket together. Uh, we were very much involved in the student union. He was very active and I'm enjoying because of his active. I was secretary and he was the chairman that time. So Nimesh, uh, as I say, we were playing cricket many times five days a week. So I think that friendship uh, grew uh, all these years and we have captured up that relationship. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kotari. Uh, Mr. Shroff, let me ask you, uh, uh, you've had a long association as well with Mr. Kampani. Any secrets here that you'd like to reveal? Uh, and there's no, no real secret except for the fact that he's the most... He's the keeper of everybody's secrets. secrets exactly. <laughs> uh, clearly, uh, one of the most, if not the most uh, brilliant mind in this space. And I think two other things. One is at the professional level, everything that has to be said has been said. But as a human being as well, I think uh, that's probably the most important thing. And the manner in which he sort of inspires trust in all stakeholders is incredible. So I think he represents goodness as well in corporate India. I think these are the, probably the two things that I would sort of uh, say. Well, Mr. Kothari and Mr. Shroff, appreciate you joining us here. So let me start, sir, by asking you about uh, and take you back to 1973, which is when you actually started. Uh, what was the idea that you had back then? And, you know, what was the ambition when you actually started JM? Actually, you know, I must uh, give a credit to my cousin, Mahindra Kampani. <clears throat> we had a lot of discussion. And he said, why you want to go and do practice as a chartered accountant? Why can't we do something different? I said, let me give a two years time where I will sit and do the br in a broking business and thereafter we'll decide what to do. So I started the work in 1st January 1972 mm -hmm. and my better half got engaged to me on 25th of January. So I always used to tell her that, listen, JM is my first wife, you are my second. <laughs> And she knows that, and I must say that she has stood with me like a rock 
all my crises aruna is always with me and uh, she has brought up the children and uh, i have worked tirelessly continuously so my idea actually fructify 1973 hmm. i was not liking the partnership form status unlimited liability broking from the role partnership in those days so i told my brother that listen why can't we form a separate company and we work together but that will be limited liability company mm-hmm. and frankly we started with what portfolio management and issue management and these are the two things we started with and thereafter the rest is history because from the very first year we started making profit and we all invested 5000 rupees and that's my investment so far well i i hope a lot of people take lessons from the way that you've managed your money and the kind of uh, investment that you've done but let me take you now to the point when you brought morgan stanley on board sir uh you know what was it like at that point in time because india was a very different place not just to do business but it was a very different economy what was it like to bring morgan stanley on board actually i didn't bring morgan stanley on board they brought me on the board i never approached them they came and approached me and who was that person nainalal kidwai one day she comes to my office and tells me nimesh she was she was the ceo of the morgan stanley india and for last four to five years he says we have been debating whether we should create a local partnership mm. would you be interested i said without any commitment i am willing to discuss but at that time we have a letter of understanding with credit suisse first boston mm. so it was very tricky and we had negotiation for about 6 to 8 months with morgan stanley i went two three times to us met john mack vikram pandit and and all those people over there and then finally they decided that yes this is the right candidate and then we created a partnership and i think there was amazing partnership morgan stanley is a great firm and uh, for 10 years from 1997 to 2007 we worked together and uh, ultimately in 2007 they decided to part the company because my friend hemendra kothari had already gone <laughs> Uday Kotta also is gone from old Goldman Sachs, so Marilyn Goldman is gone. So Morgan says, but our board is asking us other two people are hundred percent. Why are you at fifty-fifty huh. partnership? So finally, they decided to walk out. There was no provision in a joint venture agreement, but they decided to do that. And if a partner doesn't want to work with you, you can't force it. No, you can't. Uh, but let me cut to the future because you talked about Vikram Pandit, and Vikram Pandit is going to be part of the JM future going forward. And there's all kinds of speculation on what that future will entail and whether it will entail banking or not, sir. So uh, I, I know, I know you're you're probably going to say that now. I should ask these questions to Vishal, but I'm going to give it a shot and ask you this question <laughs> about what we should expect in the future. I'm still a chairman of the company, you know. <laughs> <laughs> non executive but <laughs> and 66% shareholder okay so then 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 you then you then you have full full uh, sort of uh, then i should be asking this question of you so so what should we expect in the future listen uh, we had did apply earlier we didn't get the license from rbi now the new license regime has again come back yes and license on tap frankly we haven't decided yet what we want to do but we are going to be in discussion and decide maybe normally vikram comes in the month of december to india mm. so when he comes we'll have a detailed discussion and then we'll take a call whether we want to apply or too much crowd has taken place in a banking so we are not made up our mind we have some strategy in our mind so watch us next year we will know Let me ask you about how you see things as far as the economy is concerned, Mr. Kampani. And today, uh, you know, we're dealing with uh, with geopolitical tensions that are rising, uh, but. the strength of the indian economy is not being questioned the fundamentals are strong the macros are looking better we've got a credit policy coming up on the 4th of october as you look at the economy today what are the high points for you you see first of all the new government which has come into power mr narendra modi's government have done some wonderful things on policy matters and these policy matters which they have brought in 
will have fruits in our next three years' time. Because they are just changing policy one by one. If you really look at it, they are removing old legislation which are 100 years old. 1,500 legislation they are repealing. They have all done this insurance. They have done defense. Yes. They have also done GST now. And Swachh Bharat. So, you know, the, the new policies which the mm. government is thinking about is going to give result over a period of time. Mm. Naturally, make in India. But the point which I am making is this, that today the biggest problem which we are facing in the country is the non-performing assets of the bank. Mm. And that, that has to be resolved. Unless they are not able to resolve, our credit offtake has come down to about 9, 9.5%, mm. which always used to be about 15, 16%. And therefore, you know, there are, there are no new big projects which are coming up. Mm. And therefore, to that extent, the investment from the Indian entrepreneurs is lacking. Mm. Only the new projects are coming up like a new uh, B2B or B2C ventures or venture capital companies mm. in which about four or five billion dollars <coughs> has come in. So my view is this, that existing business are growing, cash flow is coming, but the new big projects are not there at the moment. Mm. I hope the defense will bring that, you know. I hope some of the further investment in insurance business will take place. And GST, when it gets implemented hopefully by 1st of April, could bring about 1% increase in a GDP. But let me ask you about what we're seeing on Deal Street. And there is a considerable amount of consolidation across a bunch of sectors, whether it's telecom or others. Uh, what's your sense on M&A and consolidation? And, and uh, uh, you know, how, what will the picture look like five years from now, given where you are today? I think... Consolidation in telecom is already done, you know, except one or two players which are left out. But there are going to be a three to four major player like uh, Bharti, Vodafone, Jio and Idea. Mm. These are the four major players who are going to be there. Okay, there are other players also, but I don't know how they will survive because they also have to think about survival because some of them are having debt. There are some companies are getting merged. So those kind of things are also happening. But really now the, what Jio has announced, the competition has hot up. Mm. And therefore, one has to see how the uh, Vodafone has sent $5 billion to India. Yes. So I think on that basis, the basic issue which really comes up is to see you know, how which three or four major players will survive. Mm. I think that's more critical than having a consolidation. Because some people may not want to buy some of the low companies which are having a huge debt problem. Uh, you know, let me ask you about your prognosis as far as technology is concerned, because you took uh, TCS public. And, you know, questions are being raised today on whether Indian tech companies can actually transition or pivot themselves out of the legacy businesses now to digital and so on and so forth. As you see the tech landscape today, uh, how would you rate Indian IT? I think Indian IT is just doing at the moment, you know, the services, IT services, you know, to, to the, all the multinational client outside of India. You know, one of the top companies, I will not name it, you know, I asked his CEO about four years back. And I said, you know, you have a liquid company, mm -hmm. got a lot of cash sitting on your balance sheet. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are just doing IT services business at the moment. Why are you not thinking like creating something like Facebook or Google? Mm. Because these are the brand has been created in the next last 10 years. And those companies, you know, have become billions of dollar companies. So why our four or five top IT services company cannot say I'm putting $25 million or $50 million in a risk capital and I want to change a course of action through a subsidiary company? Mm. Answer was very simple, no, no, that's not our core competence and we cannot do this. What is required is out-of-box thinking for them. And if they don't do out-of-box thinking and think something, you know, and create innovation over there, then there'll be huge competition also coming in from some of the players which are getting into cloud and other services mm -hmm. outside of India. You know, and now what is it? So the you're not feeling very confident or optimistic? No, I'm, I'm feeling that a growth rate which was once upon a time... 100% per year or 80% per year is now come down to 3% and 4% per year. 
therefore they have to innovate something mm. and they have to think differently on that basis you know unless they don't do that there'll be a problem as i see it in next 5 years or 10 years time What about the problems that the Indian conglomerates are facing today? Uh, we've heard from Cyrus Mistry uh, in his latest address to shareholders saying that tough decisions will need to be taken. For instance, when we talk about businesses that continue to perform and businesses that don't continue to perform. But on the conglomerate model, specifically in the Indian context, what are the key challenges that you foresee? And you were talking about the need for innovation and drastic innovation in Indian IT. What is the need to try and shake things up uh, within Indian conglomerates? You see, the conglomerates is a you know as a problem like this. Because there are some small businesses, and there are some large businesses. The large businesses, you know, which are in a cyclical nature, they are suffering today. You know, something like you know steel business is suffering. But I think now the steel prices have come up. So, frankly speaking, the huge debt which they are having. So sometimes I feel that some of the steel companies are working for lenders and not for shareholders. <laughs> But it's difficult to raise capital today, you know, in these circumstances. And then there is the issue of dilution, etc. So they have to pass this cycle. It's not that a good time can come, mm. but might take some more time. But if you really look at the problem of all these conglomerates, they have to think again, you know, that which are the businesses that are core to them, and which are the businesses that are not core to them. Those mm. businesses which are not core to them. they can consider you know divesting for example tata capital mm. tata Ca tata chemicals have divested the fertilizer business you know today and you know they have finalized the selling of that business so you know they just want to then focus on their core competence that's the way they have decided at the moment and i think uh, there are lot of other other groups you know which are you know facing lot of problems mm -hmm. and those group will have to think innovatively or they do start selling their assets and repay the debt because these banks you know would want that money back hmm. and and rightfully so and they they need their money back and i think the government also is backing the bank like anything and they said you shall recover your money hmm. so you know that is the whole issue that think about it can you make a evida profit or you can't make a profit then you can't just continue to stick on that businesses you got to get out of those businesses the government uh, in almost a decade now has finalized or at least the cabinet has approved the first strategic stake sale and my conversation with mr kant yesterday he very clearly suggested that a lot more will follow and very very quickly so perhaps we will see more this financial year itself what do you make of that how confident do you feel about the government's plans to divest strategic assets i mean uh, to go through with strategic sales uh, and and also in terms of the uh, sort of ofs offerings that the government is looking as far as public sector undertakings is concerned see i think the government you know divestment is a right thing to do because government cannot be in the business the, the government should worry about you know how to how to help the people of this country have notes you know must get something out of that so you know it's no use sitting on those businesses so i think i'm i'm glad that you are telling me that you know government is going to announce soon you know some of the selling of the businesses uh, the legend of nimesh kampani is that he is the keeper of secrets uh, and 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 secrets across corporate india your corporate india's uh, confidant uh, how did that come to be a lot of people tell me to write a book I said, if I write will a you? book, will you? I don't know the answer. If I write a book, I think a lot of people's secret will come out. <laughs> <laughs> will they? Will they be very unhappy, deeply disappointed, scared? What will the feeling be? No, I think. I think, even if I write the book, I have to be balanced. You know. it would be balanced but but what was it mr kampani why and why was it that people were okay to share secrets and sometimes you had secrets of you know competitors as well you were sort of uh, mediating between warring fractions as well i mean how how did what was that experience like for you listen more speak less <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the mantra is it yeah. listen always more. listen hmm you know people should become people become impatient and not listen to client you listen to client more you will digest it and you will find solutions okay don't start giving your solution before client speaks you know 
take I take that point on board. But very quickly before you are a journalist to do that. The, the journal, journalists are always <laughs> always impatient with asking questions. I I must admit. But let me ask you this, sir. Since we're talking about uh, uh, Deal Street and and uh, IPOs, and we've just had a big listing yesterday as well. Uh, what do you make of the IPO pipeline? What do you make of the way that very good pipeline? Uh, what do you make of the way that they have been priced off late? Yesterday was a bad day, you know, with the war and other things, you know, geopolitical situation, so market went down. But it's a good time to buy that stock. Okay. Because it has gone down, so investors should pick it up. Hmm. And you believe that we are going to continue to see a robust pipeline as far as IPOs are I concerned? I think so. I think. Because our firm has also got a robust pipeline. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> But we've got a lot of, uh, uh, as I said, esteemed guests with us here this afternoon. So let me uh, try and get some questions in. Uh, Madhu, I'm going to start with you. So this is this is your chance to ask Mr. Kampani a question that you've always wanted to ask him. Nimesh Bhai has always come across the most helpful person in the community I have met. Whenever I have approached him, he's been very, very kind. So Nimesh Bhai, you talked about the uh, consolidation and uh, the debt, uh, uh, the conglomerate must sell assets. But do you really see, because we have not seen too many transactions happen, even though a lot of people are wanting to uh, sell assets. So what is the reason why, uh, uh, what is it holding up? Because we know that there is so much foreign capital which is available at negative interest rate. Why is it that all that money is not coming up and the transactions are not happening? You see, the whole problem is, you know, you are in a stock market. You know the market very well. There are two whores. One is a hope and another is a fear. In a market when you are buying something, you hope it will go up. Okay? And you don't fear that it will go down. Yeah. Our industrial is in that situation. They are all hoping against hopes. And they are not fearing that, that the prices will further go down, their assets will also go down, then the debt will remain with interest meter going. Interest meter is like a taxi meter, it never stops. It works in the night also. At least we sleep in the night. <laughs> interest meter doesn't stop there. So I think that's very important lessons where people should not just get that this is my asset. It's company's asset and the company's liability. You know, the liability ultimately, you know, the bankers are going to ask promoter to put personal money otherwise. And therefore it is very important that you should think about it and get rid of the assets which you can sell. How much of this has to do with promoter ego? No, I think uh, it's not ego. I think they're not well advised. Hmm. You're being politically <laughs> correct, aren't you, sir? <laughs> Ashok. So, you know, I've been uh, Nimesh Bhai's... Uh, it's all, it's all. ...neighbor uh, until he deserted us and moved into a better building. I got still a flat there. You know. <laughs> I can come back sometime. No, but, but more importantly, we are going to be neighbors if he moves into the new house that we are moving. Yeah. So, so we were far apart, Tower A and B at Mekatas, but we'll be on the same floor if uh, he moves into Signature Island, uh, hopefully soon. But, but I do want to share one anecdote. Nimish Bhai, uh, it was 1998, I was uh, quitting Arthur Anderson and moving on. And my senior colleague uh, from Anderson's asked me, what are you going to do? And I said, I want to be an investment banker. And he said, but you know, you're a chartered accountant with tax advice, uh, you know, why investment banker? So I said, I know a gentleman called Nimesh Kampani. Mm. And this is a fact. Uh, I know a gentleman called Nimesh Kampani. He's a chartered accountant. I'm a chartered accountant. He had ambitions of wanting to become a cricketer. I wanted to become a cricketer. He played serious cricket. I played serious cricket. And he's become a very eminent chartered accountant. And I th he's become a very eminent investment banker. And I think uh, I think I can follow suit. So honestly, the inspiration to change tracks uh, from a tax advisor to investment banking was largely driven by a silent observation of what you have achieved. And I can tell you that my organization continues to observe your organization from a distance and admire you, of course, but more importantly, also wish that we can emulate the way you have built your business and the way you have. The most important thing is in the business of deal making, and we are quite a few of us over here, it's very difficult to remain honest, transparent, maintain your integrity, and yet be successful. And I think Nimesh Bhai is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a living legend and example of how each of these values have been cultivated, not just in him, but into his organization. 
and i wish one day we can get close enough to what you have built nimesh bhai that will be our desire and and, and honestly ramesh i never had the privilege of actually working with him with the equity side not in the investment backing side so i just make a comment on the historical importance of nimesh bhai you know a lot of us believe that the last street is a cathedral to capitalism that it's uh, you know a place of worship for us because we sincerely believe in the profession and if you actually believe that he was the michelangelo mm. he made the sistine chapel he painted it put it with life when nimesh bhai joined the market companies were starved of capital and it was thanks to nimesh bhai himendra bhai vallabh bhai and the others uh, who elevated the last three to global levels today we are in the top 5 global stock markets in the world and we could only get there because they provided the liquidity to the companies so we are behind in china in almost everything but in capital markets we are ahead and i think large part of the credit goes to Uh, investment bankers in the ilk because they provide the capital in a capital staffed country mm. they kept alive the tradition of equity markets which was uh, you know not existent say in china or other parts of the world and in a socialistic state you know mm. where you had dividend control acts so many things so ananda and gratitude i think we all enjoy the benefits of the seeds they plowed in 1980s shirin and that does deserve a big round of applause What does the the future hold as far as Indian equities are concerned? What is your outlook, near term uh, and long term? You see, Indian equities. What I am seeing is this: that today, if our economy is going to become five times, in that by 2025, that's McKinsey report says that you know, assuming it's not 25, 2027, whatever it is, what is the ratio of GDP to the market capitalization? you know today market cap is 1.6 trillion dollar and gdp is 2 trillion dollar mm. if it becomes five times become 10 trillion dollar the market cap should be 8 trillion 8 trillion dollar as mm. simple as that at least 8 to 9 trillion dollar so i think that you know i am very bullish on india there is no question about it but we should not and uh, this government at the moment is taking a right steps and direction mm. if you look at the central government where is the corruption at the top all the corruption is not there now you know and mr modi what he had said you know he has delivered on that basis mm. so i think what i am seeing is this i was talking to you know one of the uh, senior person in the ministry and if you look at the income tax department what i am hearing is this that everything be online yeah and therefore the income tax officer also will have to ask question you online and there is no need to meet the income tax officer by the assessee if that happens the corruption in the level at different mm. level also will reduce mm. so i think what india wants india needs and wants is this ease of doing business sure facility to the all the tax payers you know and should get a red carpet treatment mm. So I think those kind of things will also bring foreign investment substantially. All these messages are going abroad. Right. It's not that it's not going abroad. Uh, let me come to you now. Uh, uh, you've just heard what Mr. Kapani has had to say. Your questions or comment for him? No, as Ramesh very nicely put it, that he has been inspiration and he has been one of the catalysts for Indian capital market for last three decades. Maybe I'll have his views. Uh, but maybe I'll have two, three questions for him. One is. what has been the most exciting time for him personally and what has been the most toughest or a disappointing or a difficult time for him and for india and how does he look at india in next 3 decades okay so let's start and indian capital markets yeah let's start with the first one the most think, exciting and I think most my most exciting time was in 1980 when i got a challenge of doing telco issue telco is now tata motors yes and you will not believe the capital market has grown from that day because the company wanted to raise 47 crore of rupees by way of a convertible bond issue the last issue which was there in the market was about 4.5 to 5 crore which was southern petrochemical industries and mangalore fertilizer mm. and this company wanted to raise 10 times the money in the market every year market was raising only 50 60 crore of rupees and one company wanted to raise 50 60 crore and then we got a mandate from tatas to do that job and we were sole banker to that issue and i remember very distinctly that the first time in india there were 47 investors conferences all over india we organized that i went to government ministry of finance 
because we saw in the Reserve Bank regulation that priority industry can raise money from non-resident Indian with right of repatriation. And so I asked for a permission. After a lot of discussion, we got the permission from Ministry of Finance. And we went for a roadshow to 10 countries in the world. We filed a prospectus in London. We were in whole of the Middle East, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Sarja, you know, and all this uh, other, see, Kuwait, Bahrain, etc. And we had about 15, 16 roadshows over there. And we raised the money. And the government of India, the Secretary, Control of Capital Issue called me and said, Dimesh, you got the permission. Now you raise the money. <laughs> Don't just keep the permission. So I had to go to Tes Telco, the Expo, export department. And I asked them, where do you export your truck? Please tell me. He said, Africa. I said, no, no, Africa. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Middle East. I said, okay, Middle East is okay. Southeast Asia, okay. London is okay. So this is the way we went about. And after that, the Reserve Bank guideline came. As I said, now you allotted the shares, the debentures. If you, somebody wants to sell it, and all the non-resident Indian guideline came first. That's how the whole market got created. Indian market was created by Tata Motors. That's the way I see it, you know. Okay. And that was an exciting time for me. So that was the most exciting. What was the most challenging? The most challenging, uh, you know, there are a lot of challenging things, you know. We, we don't, we have time, sir. You can, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sonawala is sitting here, you know, you can ask him. <laughs> I've been very, I've been already warned that I can't ask Mr. Sunawala any questions. So that googly you can't throw my way now. I, I throw it right back at you. <laughs> no, I think uh, the, the most challenging was also TCS. Because TCS has a huge market cap. They didn't want to dilute 25%. There was no guideline that you can, you know, make a lower than 25% issued to the public and get listed. Mm. Mr. D.R. Mehta was the SEBI chairman. I went to him, I talked to him. I said, sir, but this issue may not sell. The 10% issue is becoming 3,000, 4,000 crore. So, you know, you have to raise 12, 13,000 crore of rupees and a company does not need that kind of money. So, why are you forcing? And then after a lot of discussion, and Mr. D.R. Mehta has a good style. Mm. He will call, you know, Pratip Kar, he will call Dharmishtha Rawal, everybody in your room and say, Nimesh Bhai is saying this now, what is your view? Huh. And it was so embarrassing for me. <laughs> so after the meeting is over, I go to their room and say, sorry, I have not called you, I have not called you. <laughs> because I said, next issue of mine will get stopped by then, you know. <laughs> and then finally he saw the merit and he agreed to do 10% issue. Mm -hmm. And then with that 10% issue, you know, we went to the road show and Hemendra was with me, you know, on that deal. And uh, we finally got the deal done. And Mr. Tata was very fair, you know. He, in fact, reduced voluntarily, you know, the price. Mm. You know, when we were, we were negotiating finally as a banker and the company, he said, no, you know, I will give some benefit. Mr. Sunawala and Mr. Tata both said, you know, we'll give some things thing to the investor. And then rest is the history. TCS has done yeah. so well, so well. Investors are very happy. So that was the most challenging. I'll ask, uh, I'll add a third to uh, Nirmal's list. The most disappointing. Oh. Disappointing from which point of view? Because I don't have a disappointment in my group. <laughs> we always done a good issues, you know, they've done well. m and transactions mm. we have done successfully. Mm. So, so no disappointment are, at all in over three decades. None whatever whatsoever. we are touch, it has become gold. <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope that luck uh, is something that everyone else is, is uh, sort of favoured with as well, uh, Mr. Kampani. But uh, Mr. Shroff, any, any uh, questions or comments or stories? Uh, another sort of outstanding uh, quality of Nimesh Pai is that he never refuses to accept the status quo as a sort of a roadblock to a problem. So we've done so many, including the first book built issue, Nimesh, if you remember that, uh, when, the, when we were moving away from a capital controlled environment with the CCI to a price discovery mechanism and we sat down together on terms of what was then the guideline. And we worked out together how you can actually bring this new regime into, the law was completely against you. 
So one of the things which professionally I've seen working together and sometimes across the table is he would refuse to accept the status quo and he would work in a sense above the guidelines or above the law and, and make it happen, whether by talking to the regulator or talking to all stakeholders. And in that entire process, keep the trust of all stakeholders. I think that is the real legacy of Nimesh Bhai, of being able to A, build trust and B, change the, and innovate uh, continuously on a deal by deal basis and that's what i have learned personally uh, working with him so you it's know, been a great privilege i'm going to now give the last few minutes to you vishal uh, uh, i'm sure you've you've had your fair share of uh, your questions being answered by him but there's anything at all that, that you would like him to to respond to today no, I don't have any uh, any specific question for him, but you know, I I think I've been uh, blessed, and uh, learning from him over the last three decades has been simply fantastic. Uh, I can say I started my career at home, uh, listening to his phone conversations with clients. So I would only listen to what he is saying and try and figure out what the client is saying on the other side. <laughs> and that was a very, very interesting way to start learning. Did you also have to sign an NDA at home because you were <laughs> privy to, to these phone conversations? Yeah. Uh, not really. Luckily, trained in the family values. So uh, trust is an inborn factor. Hopefully, I will keep that going. Uh, and I want to say all the best. And I think uh, you've given me a very big responsibility. As uh, one of our very close friends and clients told me, you know, you don't have boots to fill, you have gum boots to fill. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, Mr. Kampani, uh, you've always said that succession planning is one of the most important things that an organization must put in place, and hence you've put forward your succession plan. Uh, today is the day, in a sense, when you uh, step away from, uh, from JM as you turn uh, 70. Uh, what is it that you would like to tell Vishal and the team? I think uh, I think I must say that you know I've got a fantastic team. I think pe people here, if you see some of them, Dipti, for example, is a chief group chief operating officer, is more than 30 years with us. Started as a as, a, as an analyst and now she's joined is this, this position. So Raju Chitrabanu, you know, is running our financial services company. He's been with us for over 15 years. The Subodh Sinkar also is for about 18, 20 years. You know, all these people here, you know, Sonia, Atul, you know, uh, Devan, they're all, all there with me. And therefore, you know, that culture gets created and that culture goes down. You know. And whenever a new employee joins our group or when we recruit from IIM Ahmedabad and other places, I meet them first. I tell them what to do and what not to do. Mm. And I say, if what told, was told to you, what not to do, if you do it, you're sacked. So what not to do? Share that list with us. <laughs> Insiders trading, you know, internal information, sharing with the wife and friends, showing off, you know, within a party that I did this deal and I did this and I did that. I said, all those things, you can't do it. Many a times my wife doesn't know what I'm doing, mm. you know, and, and that's the way, you know, we we keep that going in our farm, you know, because our our asset is what our people. They come in the lift every day and they go away in the lift. So tomorrow he may not come if he doesn't want to come. You have to nurture them, you know. We have to give them a freedom. We should work with them. We should treat them very nicely, humanly, you know. I think these are the qualities you know an organization should have. Then only the people are interested in coming to the office and working on that basis. So I think this younger generation is brilliant, you know. And these people, you know, I feel they'll do much better than what we have done. Because they have a huge information. They've got one uncle called Google. <laughs> you know? And they just have so to why go uncle? It. it could be an auntie also. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Cyril. Sonia is also saying to me, you know, yes, 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 you know. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, in my days, if I wanted to study something, like I was trying to study Keynes, I used to go to JN Petit Library for one hour to find books, two hours. Now you can be online, you can get information so fast. So I think the whole scenario has changed. And the younger generation is fantastic. And I think uh, India is blessed today. Because our young generation, you know, will be about 18 to 20% of the world population. 
and uh, demography is fantastic. So I feel that all our people who are young here will do very well in the farm. So my final question to you, Mr. Kampani, what next? Any personal goals that, uh, that you've put down on a list that you want to accomplish? No, you see, what I will do next three, four years, I'll mentor them. Whenever they need me, I'll be available. But I want to just step aside so they can move on their own. If they are doing it well, I'm very happy. If they're not? They are not, then I have to intervene <laughs> at a board level, you know, not at the operating level, you know. But, um, and also, you know, you talk me about retirement, you know. I think you should retire when everybody asks you question why you are retiring and not saying that why not this guy goes, hmm. you know. So I think you should choose your time also rightly on that basis, you know. Well, Mr. Kampani, thank you very, very much for joining us here. Thank you very much for your contribution to the Indian capital markets, for uh, your contribution to creating a culture, uh, not just an equity culture, but a culture that has benefited the Indian economy. Thank you very, very much. On behalf of everyone here at CNBC TV 18, congratulations once again, and we wish you all the very best of luck as you start your new innings. Thank you very much, sir, thank for joining you. us thank today. You. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate your time. Thank you all so much for joining us here. I, I know you hate cutting a birthday cake, but we've taken the liberty. And this is, this is your, your family and friends, sir. So it's your circle of trust. So I, I hope you can do the honors this time. But thank you very, very much for joining us here today.